morning, everybody. I think we'll get started as people start to roll in. Good morning and welcome to this workshop, The Sanctuary Model. I'm Stacy Geringer, Director of Outreach at the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare, also known as CASHU. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, this webinar is the third of four in a series, and it's a partnership with the Center for Practice Transformation, which is also located in the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota, and is funded through the School of Social Work at the University and the Title IV E grant facilitated by the Minnesota Department of Human Services, with federal funding provided by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This session will again be led by Steve Carlson, clinical trainer with the Center for Practice Transformation. Um, and it'll be about an hour long. We really encourage your engagement and we'll make sure that you have the ability to talk in the chat and um, use the Q&A as well as raise your hand. We will record this um, webinar and then we'll email it out to all registrants and attendees. And it will also be posted on our website. CEUs will be emailed out in the next week or so. And then there will be a brief evaluation survey. We really encourage you um, to fill out at the end to please give us feedback. And like I said, we encourage your participation and are really excited to hear uh, about the sanctuary model today from Steve. So I'll let him take it away. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good to see a lot of familiar names on the screen. And Alan, by the way, I will get back to you. Just wanted to let you know that. Um, I'm excited for that. Uh, this is our third webinar in a series where the topics are connected to each other with the main topic is around resilience, particularly for child welfare workers and how do we build a quality of resilience in ourselves and in our teams and then how do we, uh, for next week, it'll be dealing with uh, the, the larger systems that we work within. Last week, we focused on compassion fatigue and burnout and vicarious uh, trauma with compassion fatigue being the, the cost of caring and with burnout being repetitive tasks or difficult tasks or uh, really the type of tasks that we do can lead to, to burnout when they are repetitive and over long periods of time, too much work uh, to do and not enough time. And then vicarious trauma, it's, it's how to manage those tragic life events that we hear in our work and sometimes feel somewhat uh, powerless. And, and what was mentioned is the sense of futility that can uh, be part of our uh, experience in this work. Our, our first week, we focused on uh, a listening session. And so many of you indicated that the greatest challenge that you face uh, is related to the systems. Uh, uh, our teams and team dynamics, uh, court systems, county rules, uh, lack of housing, uh, economic inequalities and poverty. And those were all the, the, the biggest challenges that we face that continue to affect our own ability to be resilient and remain connected to our own core values, which are, many of you said, the reason that you work in this field, what sustains you in this work is the sense of purpose the word compassion, satisfaction uh, was mentioned, or the love of children and focused on their well-being sustains us in this work. Uh, some mentioned that having a helpful supervisor and supportive colleagues is what sustains them. The privilege and honor of doing this work and being a supervisor and a mentor or the work of uh, maintaining work-life balance, these are the things that sustain us and at the end of last week, I uh, refocused a little bit on a safety plan and a self-care plan. Safety plan is what do I do in the moment 
when something difficult happens, a challenge or a, 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 a client is angry with us or the, 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 the judge does something that we feel is not in the best interest of the child, what do we do in that moment to manage our emotional reactivity and remain connected to our core values? The self-care plan is the ongoing activities that we do our lifestyle that leads to a greater sense of well-being and developing those resilient roots to manage the daily grind of, of going into work and working in challenging uh, situations. So I'm going to continue our conversation around resilience by focusing in on what's called the sanctuary model. And I'm gonna explain uh, what that is. So our agenda for today is I'm gonna do a mindfulness meditation called the circle of care. It'll be about five minutes. So it'll be a chance for you to just settle in and experience uh, a five, six minutes of quiet and a way to just go inside yourself and honor the circle of care of colleagues and family and friends. Then we're gonna talk just briefly about the challenges of team dynamics and then I'll get into a little bit of, around uh, the sanctuary model. And so I want to do just this meditation. Um, and so by way of introduction, I know this is working in child protection is extremely uh, stressful. And the toll of that stress on our uh, and our biological vulnerabilities on our bodies and our minds and emotions is quite immense. It's also true that the human body and spirit is powerfully adaptive and fiercely courageous. And one of our greatest strengths is our ability to develop supportive bonds and, and uh, bonds with each other, both uh, supporting healing in ourselves and supporting healing in others. So our meditation today honors the emotional bond we have with others, including our colleagues and what we can call the circle of care. This is a practice that's taught by a Tibetan Buddhist, Lama Rod Owen, and what he refers to as the seven homecomings. In this meditation, we're invited to recognize and honor our own personal circle of care. So allow yourself to settle into a comfortable position and either gently close your eyes or soften your gaze as you become aware of your breath and just breathe slowly and deeply. With each breath, allow yourself to become more deeply relaxed. As you relax into the stillness, begin contemplating the first homecoming this is the homecoming of the guide. Reflect on any being, human or divine, who has been a guide, a teacher, a mentor, or an elder for you. Reflect on the beings in your life whom you've gone to for guidance and support. Invite them to gather around you in a circle and say, welcome. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to being held by your guides. The second homecoming is your wisdom books. Reflect on any book or scripture or other reading material that has helped you to deepen your wisdom. These books can include any writing, teachings, sacred scriptures, anything that has helped you to experience clarity, openness, love, and compassion. Say welcome to these writings. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to being held by your wisdom text.
The third homecoming is community. Begin by reflecting about the communities, groups, and spaces where you experience love or the feeling of being accepted and supported in being happy. Where do you feel the most safe, where you can love, where you can be loved? Say welcome to your communities. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to being held by your communities. The fourth homecoming is your ancestors. Begin by reflecting on those ancestors who have wanted the best for you, including wanting you to be happy and safe. You don't need to know who these ancestors are. Also reflect on the lineages you feel connected to, like the lineage of your spiritual tradition or tradition of art or activism. As you invite your ancestors, remember that you too are in the process of becoming an ancestor. Say welcome to your ancestors and lineages. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to being held by your ancestors and lineages. The fifth homecoming is the earth. Begin by reflecting on how the earth sustains your life and the lives of countless beings. Coming home to the earth means touching the earth, acknowledging the earth and allowing it to hold you. And as it holds you, understanding that it is loving you as well. Say welcome to the earth. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to being held by the earth. The sixth homecoming is silence. Begin by reflecting on the generosity of silence as something that helps you to have the space to be with yourself. Reflect on how you can embrace silence as a friend and or lover invested in your health and well-being. Say welcome to the silence. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to being held by the silence. Finally, the seventh homecoming is yourself. Begin by reflecting on your experience of your mind and body. Consider how your experiences are valuable, important, and crucial. Invite all the parts of yourself into your awareness, including the parts of yourself that seem too ugly or overwhelming. Say welcome to yourself. Relax, inhale, exhale, and come home to yourself. Now imagine that your circle of benefactors begins to dissolve into white light and gather that white light into your heart center. Rest your mind. And relax. And you can just bring yourself back into the space that you're in. And our community of learners and collaborators and our own circle of care here in our webinar. As I begin to talk a little bit of an introductory by introductory comments to, uh, to the sanctuary model. I, I think we can all uh, have a sense of understanding of what wounded healers is. It really was probably based in great Greek philosophy, 
but Carl Jung especially coined the term or at least identified the archetypal dynamic of wounded healers. In the 1970s, Henry Nouwen wrote a book called Wounded Healers. He's a, a Dutch Catholic priest who identified strongly with people with disabilities and people who had challenges I mean, to the point that he lived at, at Larch, which is a, a community for intellect, people with intellectual disabilities in France for, for nine months and was a strong advocate of a sense of being present to others in our own wounding. The research tells us that we who are in the helping professions uh, are, have experienced our own uh, wounding. 53% uh, in social service work report two or more ACE uh, studies in the uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences study that was done by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC. Another uh, mentor of mine, Richard Rohr, states that hurt people hurt people. But I also think about that healed people heal people. So what is sanctuary and why is it uh, something for us to consider and explore a little bit uh, in, our, in our own uh, work? Take a moment just to think about for yourself, where is that space, that, that place, particularly with people, whether that is colleagues, uh, a supervisor who provides compassionate supervision and support, even in the midst of some of the, the difficulties and sometimes failures that we have in our work, or perhaps it's uh, another place, a group of friends or others where you feel the space to completely be yourself, to say what's on your heart and what's on your mind as a way to increase our bonds with others by bringing our full self into those relationships. There is a definition by Sandra Bloom, who is one of the founders of the sanctuary model in one of her three books, and I'll let you know what those books are in a second, but in her book called Destroying Sanctuary, where she observed in the 1990s, particularly with the beginning of managed care, where there were many conditions that were not being treated with enough care. For example, 30-day stays in, in hospitals. Back in the 80s, we had stays in hospitals people could be in there for much longer. Her quote anyways, is that uh, sanctuary is a place of refuge from danger, threat, injury, and fear. It has been recognized since ancient times and scientific research has validated that for physical and emotional healing to occur, people need such a protected space in order to allow time, healers, and the natural powers of recovery to work their magic. And so I'm gonna get started with a poll here. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen so that I can uh, see what is being uh, said here. But we're gonna start a poll that I'd like you to take and just to think about your own organization and your own team, which is our focus of conversation today. Uh, in terms of interpersonal team dynamics, where do you find yourself the most successful? And you can uh, click more than one of these. The first area, what, um, the question, what areas of interpersonal team dynamics is your agency most successful in? Is it safe and supportive relationships where staff uh, use and manage all forms of emotions well, you know, anger, when you get angry with each other or you, you get uh, hurt by each other, you manage those emotions. Col collaboration and brainstorming, creative solutions. To what extent is there open discussion of differing perspectives amongst your team members where you can have this uh, uh, social learning happening, 
creative solutions, a fair and equitable work environment where you are able to balance work and life together. And to what extent is there an authoritative, not authoritarian, but an authoritative yet democratic leadership style with a supervisor and or with the leadership team that it feels like you have a say in what's being uh, said there. So about half of you, I know this takes a while to really think through your team and the team dynamics and where are our strengths? Is it uh, in that it feels safe, uh, managing emotions, the ability to brainstorm in that social learning environment or appreciative inquiry, um, openly discussing differing perspectives. Uh, is it fair and equitable? And is there a, a, where you have a say that democratic leadership? So um, let's just take a look at these results uh, and feel free to add any more in the chat if you, um, I just want to, jot these down as I go through these seven areas. So from what everyone says uh, that for the, you know, safe and supportive relationships, 50% uh, of you said that, that you have that kind of, of environment. Uh, emotions are not maybe handled so well. Uh, the, the reactivity, um, and I've got a little story about my own. <laughs> Uh, quality of this particular uh, team dynamic. Uh, the highest on the list uh, is the uh, collaboration and brainstorming. That's wonderful because uh, you need to come up with creative ideas, how to respond to challenging situations. Open communication, about 39% and a fair and equitable work environment is 38%. And authoritative, uh, only one said that there is a very, uh, the authoritative role, I mean, there's you know, three different styles of leadership, the authoritative, there's authoritarian where do as I say, and then the laissez-faire where you don't have much direction. And so the authoritative or democratic approach is very small, 6%. All right, well, let's find out what doesn't go so well. So let's go on to the second poll. This is the same question, only it's asked in the reverse uh, direction. This is the area of what you are uh, least, what you see as the least uh, successful uh, in these uh, areas. So Nora, if you wanna go ahead and and run this poll. This is uh, what areas of interpersonal team dynamics is your agency least successful in? In these uh, uh, six areas. And so these are the challenges that you face. Once again, it's the same thing, a safe work environment where you can just be who you are and share your thoughts and ideas and challenges, the, how emotions are handled, uh, whether it's a, uh, a collaboration and creative solutions, open communication, a sense of uh, social responsibility where there's fair and equitable work environment and the authoritative or democratic kind of approach. This is where you are least successful or where you find your team struggles the most in these particular areas. By the way, these uh, areas collaborate with the seven sanctuary commitments that I'll be going through. So we're gonna be covering each of these areas one by one and describing them uh, about how, how these um, play out within a team. All right, so why don't we go ahead, uh, uh, a good 70% has, put their perspective in there. And Nora, what, uh, here's the, here's the, um, the results. Uh, safe and, um, safe and supportive relationships, uh, just 16%. Uh, 
said that was the least, but the highest here again is managing emotions, 63% because 0% said that this is the area that we were most successful in. So this is very interesting that managing emotions are the, uh, the lar by far the largest. Collaboration is, is quite good. Only 11% said that's difficult. Open communication, 32%. So this was pretty even here. This challenge around being able to have an open communication uh, with each other. Fair and equitable work environments also pretty high as a least successful or, you know, that there's a sense that work-life balance or the amount of workload or other challenges around finding that fair and equitable work environment. And then uh, the uh, I, I get a sense that, that this is a, an area that I have yet to explain a little bit further because just 16% that was the least. So it also was just 6% in terms of it being the, the best. So these are, represent the areas of, uh, uh, of the seven sanctuary commitments that I am going to be uh, providing some more information about. I first learned about the sanctuary model back in 2013 when the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Centers had their annual conference up in Duluth. The agency I was working with was going through a major reorganization where we were integrating our chemical and mental health divisions. And we were really struggling because of two very different cultures. And when we heard what Maggie Bennington Davis, who is a CEO of a large healthcare company out on the West Coast, when she uh, shared her information about the sanctuary model, many of us within the organization I was working at said, this is what we need. In order to navigate these organizational changes, we really need what this model has to offer. Here's the founders of the sanctuary model. Sandy Bloom is over on the left. She's a psychiatrist. Joseph uh, Fadararo, social workers in the middle and Ruth Ann Ryan's a nurse who developed this model back in the 1980s. Uh, and it has spread now where there are more than 400 organizations who are certified in the sanctuary model, which I will explain what it is in just a second. But this is some of the, the underlying, the foundational principles or understanding why do we need to have a, uh, a, a model that helps us within the organization how we relate to each other? What they state is that our organizations are these living, growing, changing systems that have its own unique biology. And therefore, because our organizations have this unique biology in what it, how it grows and changes, is that it is every bit as much susceptible to stress, strain, and trauma as the individuals who both live in our, you know, maybe residential programs or our clients, as well as our, those of us that work in the organization. We as staff are significantly impacted by the stresses and strains and how we manage change within our organizations. This complex interaction between uh, uh, traumatized clients who oftentimes, I would, I would guess, uh, if not all, in the 90 percentage points of our clients have histories of trauma. So the complex interaction between our clients, between stress staff, pressured organizations, and the whole complexity of oppressive social and economic environments leads to a parallel process whereby the ways that our clients are reacting, we too are reacting similarly, and there becomes this dynamic between us 
that can become highly dysfunctional. So the sanctuary model in its definition, in a nutshell, is that it is a treatment and organizational change model that integrates trauma theory with the creation of therapeutic communities, which there's a long history of therapeutic communities going back to all, all the way back to moral, uh, uh, moral development or uh, moral systems back in uh, the, the 18, 1800s in our psychiatric facilities or our asylums where there have been therapeutic communities that have formed to support people in their healing. So this is uh, taking trauma theory with the creation of therapeutic communities, which provides safety for both clients and the staff who work within them. And within our systems, our teams, that is what I'm applying the sanctuary model to. There's four pillars of this sanctuary model. As I mentioned in the definition, trauma theory is what uh, the realization of, of what has happened to people, particularly understanding the ACEs studies and that people continue to reenact their trauma through survival strategies in a way that they learned that worked well as a young person to stay safe, but is not working so well as a parent or caregiver. So understanding trauma theory, where we are asking the question, not so much what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. The sanctuary commitments, there are seven of those, and this is what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the presentation. Just for your information, there is a self model for working with clients. The self acronym is based on the, uh, the, the ideas of safety, emotional intelligence, managing losses, and picturing a positive future or having a vision for a better future. And the self model is a dynamic way of working with, with clients who have histories of trauma. <clears throat> the sanctuary toolkit is a set of ideas and principles uh, for how to be in our organizations. For example, one of the sanctuary uh, toolkit uh, practices is called a community meeting. Before every meeting that we have in our teams, we ask three questions of everyone, and it's meant to be really fairly quick. We ask, what are you feeling? What is your goal for this meeting? And who will help you? And by simply asking these three questions, where it takes maybe five minutes at the beginning of a, of an, uh, of a meeting, our organizational meeting, or meeting with clients, we bring in the feeling component, which is ironically the area that we do the least best in, in our own teams, because oftentimes we are not acknowledging emotion. And so by stating a, an emotion, perhaps with a brief description, but it's just simply stating the emotion, we are labeling our emotional state at that moment in the meeting. This is scary for us to do, and it shouldn't be. It honestly, in organizations that are safe, People, we, we want to use our emotions because they are oftentimes a major basis for the decisions that we make is our emotional reactions. Secondly is, uh, what is your goal for this meeting? This is the, a democratic principle that we are all part of these meetings. It's not just leadership that comes in, sets the agenda and tells us this is what the meeting is about. It's meant to be a collaborative uh, environment where everyone has a goal for this meeting. Who will help you connects us to each other in the meeting and it support, helps us to support each other. This sets off a pattern of our meetings that completely shifts the dynamics. Uh, I don't know if ever, any of you have been in meetings where there's an agenda set and there's the pre-meeting meeting and then there's the post-meeting meeting. And when you hear about what's gonna be discussed at the meeting, you get together with colleagues and say, can you believe that's what we're gonna talk about this meeting? I thought that we had resolved this issue or they're gonna be talking about this or that. Um, and remember the last meeting we had, and then at the meeting, many times, sometimes, 
no one says anything. And then there's after the meeting. Can you believe what we talked about at that meeting? And this has been a dynamic. I've been in enough organizations to know it happens. Thankfully, there are many organizations where that doesn't happen. In fact, many of you said that collaboration and that uh, and even open communication, 39% open communication and 56% said we do well at collaboration. All right, as I move towards talking about the sanctuary uh, commitments, I just want to say that this all begins um, uh, with a dream. And that is that the sanctuary is make believe. There is no such thing as a perfect organization. They, do, they don't exist. And few of us have ever experienced an organization where it is absolutely safe. Emotions are handled really well and help guide because we openly acknowledging our emotional reactions. And organizations that is socially responsible and balancing the needs of the employees with the needs of the work to get done. Or where there's a, a sense of restorative justice where we are resolving conflicts in a way that isn't punitive, but is actually restorative. So none of, none of us have been in a perfect organization. And yet, I think we can imagine that kind of an organization, probably just like we can imagine that kind of society that has these qualities uh, to it. Uh, one of the taglines that Sandy Bloom and her colleagues use is the Gandhi quote of be the change that you want to see in the world. And that is what this model is meant to do is both be an organizational change model, but also a model that we bring into the world of how we treat each other. So there are seven sanctuary commitments. I'm gonna go through each one, but this is a general picture of the seven. And I'm gonna pause after each one, give you a chance to raise a hand and ask a question or make a comment as I go through these. They are uh, a commitment to, commitment to nonviolence, both with each other and with ourselves, emotional intelligence, social learning, which is that open communication, open communication down there in the dark blue is where we can talk about what's going on with each other, uh, social responsibility, a democratic work environment, and where all of us are committed to growth and change, realizing we don't know what we don't know about ourselves. But our colleagues will see, oftentimes, before we do ourselves, our own unconscious motivations. They will experience those. And so we are committed to growth and change. This doesn't mean that we are group therapy oriented in our teams. It just means we have these commitments. So I'm going to go through them one by one. I'm going to pause after each one, after I say a few comments about each one, give you a chance to reflect on your own organization and to raise your hand and make a comment or ask a question. So we start with a commitment to nonviolence because first and foremost, we need a safe organization. And in the sanctuary model, we talk about four elements of safety. One is physical safety. It needs to be a safe place uh, to work. And of course, we need to be safe with our, our clients as well. Secondly, is what is called social safety. That is, we are safe with each other in the sense that we can talk about things and share with each other without uh, hurting each other. The third is psychological safety. This is our own responsibility to be able to manage when we get uh, dinged by somebody else with perhaps a sarcastic comment or a sarcastic email or, or, or a, a, a boss or leadership that is making decisions where we aren't involved and don't have a say. And the finally is moral safety. That's what do we do when the judge sends a child back home because it's Christmas and we know it's not good for the child. That's a sense of moral safety. How do we manage those situations? Satyagraha is a word that Gandhi used, a Sanskrit word that speaks to holding to the truth, but also 
What it means is that we respond to violence with nonviolence. It's a Martin Luther King principle uh, of, of not passivity, but of standing with the truth and speaking what is true. This also includes nonviolence to ourselves. And I'm gonna play just a brief video because uh, uh, Kristen Neff describes it better than I do around what she calls self-compassion and her research. So I'm just gonna let her explain this before I go on to the next. So how do I define um, self-compassion then? I really don't see a difference between compassion for self and others. I define them exact, the exact same way. I argue that self-compassion has the components of a sense of kindness, kindness, care, uh, understanding for yourself versus judgment, a sense of common humanity versus feeling isolated and cut off from others, um, and then a sense of mindfulness, right, being aware of the suffering that's occurring versus over-identification, which, again, I'll just clarify this in one moment. Let's go through each one separately. Okay, so self-kindness versus self-judgment. Kindness is more than just um, hearts and flowers, okay? Kindness has a very active um, component to it. It means when you're kind to yourself, you really want to comfort yourself when you're suffering. You want to alleviate your suffering. You want to soothe yourself. Okay, it's a, it's a very active um, stance where I want to do whatever I can to help myself feel as good as possible in this moment. Okay. Common humanity, um, really framing one's own experience in light of the common human experience. It's very funny, if I were to ask any of you, you know, are you a human being? Are you a human being? Yes, of course. Is everyone else a human being? Yes, of course. Does everyone else suffer? Yes, of course. You would say that logically. But in the moment when you just blew it at work, or you had someone reject you, or something really bad happens in your life, what happens non-rationally is that we get very egocentric. We feel like, why me? This is somehow has happened to me. I'm the only one who's messed up. I'm the only one who's going through that difficult time. And we feel really cut off from others. It's as if somehow when things go wrong, that's abnormal. You know, this is not supposed to be this way. Something has gone wrong. But, you know, is that the case? Has anything gone wrong? Is anything abnormal? No. <laughs> you know, that's what life is. Life goes wrong. No one in here signed a contract before you got, you know, born in this world saying, I would be perfect, my life would be perfect. And yet it's like, this is not the plan I signed up for. I'm pissed off about it, right? That's how we, that's how we react. Um, the problem with that, and there's a lot of problems with that, but one of the main things is when we feel isolated and cut off from others, you know, physiologically, that's very frightening. If you, if you think evolutionary, what, evolutionarily, one of the worst things that can happen to us is to be isolated from the group, because then we aren't safe. Um, and it's interesting, this aspect of well-being, I don't think has been studied enough. This sense of can we feel connected to others in our suffering, or do we feel isolated from others in our suffering? And just, I can tell you, in the workshops I've conducted, especially the eight-week ones, at the end, I asked people what they got out of this the most. Almost every single person says common humanity. I realize it's not just me. It's not just me who judges myself. It's not just me who suffers like this. Very important to remember that this is the human experience. This is how things are supposed to be. Okay, there's nothing has gone wrong. Yes, it's painful, but it's normal. It's natural. And then this is where the mindfulness comes in. Um, you have to be aware of your suffering in order to give it compassion. So um, mindfulness allows you not only to notice your suffering, but very important, and we'll talk about this more, to be with your suffering as it is. We don't like to be around suffering. If we could just get rid of pain, you know, we'd do it. Um, and we have lots of psychological mechanisms to avoid that, again, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. So self-compassion says, wow, pain is occurring. Can I turn toward that? Can I be with that? And you actually need to do that to be able to give yourself the caring and support you need. All right. Now, some people do say, come on, 
you have to notice your suffering isn't like blindingly obvious, I'm suffering, but it's often really not. Um, the pain caused by self-judgment, I think in some ways that's some of the worst pain all of us experience. You know, a constant, niggly, niggly pain. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not this enough. I blew it. I'm this, I'm that. But often we are so lost in the role of self-critic that we don't really stop to realize, oh my God, this is really, really hurting. You know? And in some ways it feels more comfortable to be the self-critic because at least the self-critic isn't the person that messed up. <laughs> You know, the self-critic knows you messed up. The, the part of you that feels really, you know, vulnerable and insecure and a failure. Um, often we don't give that sort of side of the um, process as much attention, okay? And then also very um, important when things go wrong in our lives, very often we go straight into problem-solving mode. It's like, there's a problem. I don't want there to be a problem. Need to fix the problem, you know, immediately. Um, and what happens is we go straight into problem-solving mode and don't stop to, again, turn towards the suffering and say, whew, this is really hard, this is difficult, I need a little, I need a little care and compassion to get me through this, then we, aren't, we really aren't at our best and our most psychologically stable when we go um, towards trying to fix that problem. Okay, so it's actually something you have to remind yourself to do before going straight into fixing problems to just acknowledge and validate how difficult the situation is. Once again, the, uh, the four elements of, of safety are physical safety, social safety, psychological safety, and moral safety. And this violence, once again, is could be this uh, self-violence where we're really hard on ourselves. And uh, the, the mentor I mentioned, Richard Rohr, says that if we don't transform our pain, we will transmit our pain. And I think that's uh, the evidence of this being the, the wounded healer is that we, we do need to be in our own process. I wanna pause for just a second if there's anyone that wants to make a comment and reflect on your own team meetings and your organization, to what extent uh, do you experience safety? In the poll, it said about 50% do not, about half. And just 16% uh, or, or 50% said that you did and 16% that you did not. And so it's actually pretty good in terms of numbers. Emotional intelligence, commitment to emotional intelligence is the second one. And this is so much research has been done since Daniel Goleman in the 90s was researching emotional intelligence and identifying that this is a key element to healthy organizations and a healthy self. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about it very much. I'm just going to give an example. I recall at a team meeting I was at several years ago, I was, I was new to the team, but I recall that the supervisor uh, made a, a, a very, very um, condescending comment to me about my inability to, to do uh, work with my computer with high tech stuff. And I just happened to be open enough that it really got in. It really, and I was so angry with her. I, 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 I just felt rage at that moment, but I didn't say anything. <laughs> I didn't stop the meeting and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What was that about? I was just, you know, I just didn't have the ability at that time to process the emotion. And I literally spent the next two years giving this, this boss the silent treatment, thinking that eventually she would somehow come around and say, why are you so upset with me? I just, you know, so I wasn't developed to a point where I could manage the, the hurt and the anger that I had uh, with her. And these kinds of situations create long-term problems within the organization because the dynamics begin to shift around how we collaborate and cooperate with each other and can be creative. So I'm gonna pause, just think about your organization. What happens that emotions are difficult to process? Because this one here, nobody said that this was the most successful area. Any comments or uh, about this um, uh, that anyone has wants to make? Just raise your hand, and Stacy can 
invite you to talk about the emotional tone within the organization. All right, well, just be thinking about your own organization and, and, uh, and how this works. The, the, the third commitment is this commitment to social learning. This one here, many of you said did really quite well at this collaborative way. Um, I've heard someone say to this first point of unlearning and learning is valued is that the only thing more difficult than learning something new is letting go of something old. I find this to be very true. I get stuck in, because in how I've done things because I did them because I believe that they were the right way to do it. But you know, all things change and our organizations need to change. They are dynamic living systems. And so this ability to recognize that we're all in the process of learning and growing and having that as a core value and a commitment to this social learning. Feedback loops, what these are is these are reflecting on what works and what doesn't work, where we get together in our team meetings and say, well, how did that work? You know, let's, let's review this decision we made and come back to it and see how it worked. Maybe there's a new policy put in place or a new practice. Let's come back to it together and collectively identify whether this worked or didn't work. So take a moment just to think about your, your current work setting and to what extent is social learning taking place where you are experiencing feedback loops and being able to uh, evaluate what's working and what's uh, not working. The commitment to open communication means that we are direct about uh, what, what happens in, with us and that there's no, there's no secrets. Yes, sometimes there are private situations, you know, um, I once worked in an organization where a, a staff person was fired. She had uh, literally stole a bunch of money uh, from the organization. And um, the way that the organization handled it is that they said, we, that the, we can't talk about this. And there were many of us who were close to this colleague who were, were, couldn't believe that she had actually you know, stolen the money. And we had a lot of emotions around that. And the organization went really far over to saying, we aren't going to talk about that at staff meetings. It's done and we just need to be over it. Well, they couldn't say some things because of legal reasons, but we didn't process our emotions. And so there was a lack of open uh, communication that happened. I do want to say that I, uh, after a couple of years working for this supervisor, I finally came back to that supervisor because she had made another decision in the organization that went against our core values. And I was able to be very clear and direct with her about my disapproval of, and in a sense with kindness, confronted her on making a policy that did not include collaboration because we had started to implement the sanctuary model and open communication and a democratic work environment became one of our core values. And so I did uh, redeem myself uh, in that way. So think about your own organization. To what extent can you talk about things or not talk about things? To what ex extent is there uh, uh, assumptions made or to the extent that there is gossip? Commitment to democracy doesn't mean that you vote on everything within the organization. What it means is everyone has a voice based on the skill level that individuals have. And so what this means is that if an employee is affected by a decision, they are included in the process of making that decision. So if there is a significant change in policy or what we're doing, there is an opportunity for everyone to have a, a voice in it, particularly if you are highly impacted by that decision. If you're peripherally impacted by the decision, you may have an email or something, but it's when you are, when your job is going to change because of that decision, you're involved in it. So think about your organization. To what extent uh, is that a practice where you are not surprised by a decision and don't have a voice uh, in that? 
The commitment to social responsibility. This is where we are balancing the needs of the individual, the needs of the organization, and the needs of the clients that we are serving. This is where um, uh, I had supported a, a group called Emma Norton Residence in implementing the sanctuary model. And one of the things that happened as we focused on self-care and the importance of self-care is that staff were beginning to to take a lot more time off work and the job wasn't getting done. So we actually swung a little bit too far because the needs of the organization, needs of the client are also critically important and the self-care of the staff is important and having open conversations about how do we balance these rights. And of course, this the role of restorative justice when something happens is that we focus on restorative justice and not punishment. So think about your own organization with respect to social responsibility. Lastly is the commitment to personal growth and change. This is where everyone is recognizing in themselves that they are growing, they are still becoming. Even Many of you have been in child welfare work for over 10 years. And yet, to the extent that we have a continuous sort of sense that I'm still growing and becoming leads to more conversations and being open to feedback from others within the organization. And it's a continuous observation of any negative habit patterns that we get into and being willing to talk about them and to allow them to change or shift as we need to. That's the seven sanctuary commitments. And uh, these are the three books. If you want to study this further, I would probably recommend reading Restoring Sanctuary which is uh, uh, the last of the trilogy. Creating Sanctuary is, is about how this model got started and what are therapeutic communities and a history around that. Destroying Sanctuary is a reflection on uh, the crisis in uh, human service organizations that kind of got started with managed care and, uh, and overstressed organizations and staff that were overstressed. Restoring Sanctuary goes into greater detail about the seven sanctuary commitments and how they might work for an organization and for a therapeutic community. I am open to questions here uh, or comments and I'm just gonna stop sharing and uh, to see if there is anything that anybody would like to comment or question about uh, about this. Yes, Alan, you wanted to know about uh, posting the seven questions or considerations that were listed in the polls. Oh, okay, sure. I guess that did that get posted? We'll get those to you, Alan. Yeah, we, I don't think they were posted, Steve. Um, oh, okay. We can send them out in the follow-up email. Sure. Okay. And there may have only been six. We, I might have missed one. Uh, so uh, we'll get that seventh one in there if we did miss one. All right. Well, uh, Stacy. Uh, uh, oh, here's a question, Kelly. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to work in an organization using the model. Um, how do you feel? What did it look like in daily work? Yes, Kelly. Um, the executive director embraced the model at Emma Norton and there were about um, 35 or 40 employees and it was received wonderfully. Well, at first it was, it was received uh, a little bit uh, skeptically uh, be, because it, it called for a uh, pretty open communication. These were breaking old patterns. Uh, but over time, I, I, I started it with a small group from each sector of the organization became the core team that I trained in the sanctuary model. And they began to embrace it, become excited about it because we practiced it in our meetings. So they gained a vision for what it can look like. And then they began to take it to the rest of the organization. And uh, I spent two years working with them on implementing it. We didn't get to a point where it got fully implemented with clients yet. They were still working on that to create 
the sanctuary model in their residential programs, it's the housing programs. And it became a much safer place uh, to work. And uh, literally people stayed longer. The retention rates were, 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 um, uh, were longer. So thanks for that question, Kelly. Okay, well, we are out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. I know Steve could probably keep talking about this, but thank you everybody for joining. Um, and like we mentioned earlier, we will get this recording out to folks to either rewatch or share to other with others, um, along with your CEUs. And um, just another plug, we have our final webinar of this series that Steve will do next week uh, called the Sea of Resilient, Resilience in a Sea of System. And then we have a, his podcast series or CPT's podcast series um, that we'll release every Monday. So we're on our third one this week and we really encourage you to check those out. Those are in the chat. Um, any other questions, feel free to email us at cashew.umn.edu and really appreciate everybody's uh, participation. And thanks again to Steve. Thanks everybody. Take care. See you next week, I hope.